Doug Whiteford makes a desperate effort in the final laps. Brabham is almost a minute ahead. He takes Winsock and goes on down the straight to meet the chequered flag. Not many of us can add the title Sir to our names, much as we would like to. But Sir Jack Brabham's story is that of a motor racing knight from simple beginnings in the suburbs of Sydney. Racing to great heights in what has to be one of the most competitive fields, international motor racing. But it was never enough for Jack to sit in fast cars and race them. He always wanted to know what makes them go. Young kid interested in motor cars was a start, really, the same as everyone else, I suppose. Yeah. But I uh, had two years in the Air Force working on aircraft engines, and that really got me interested in the engine side. Brabham started as a speedway driver and then graduated to road racing by the 1950s becoming a familiar part of the Australian motor scene. I started racing midget cars to start in 1947 and went on in 1955. I decided to go to England for a year's experience, so I went over there and it took 35 years to come back. <laughs> the engineering side in uh, Australia actually was easier for me because uh, I uh, was in tow with Repco at the time. And uh, when I went overseas, uh, I found it was much more difficult to do. And uh, when it came to uh, the change of formula in 1966, I uh, went back to Repco in Australia and got them to make the engine for me. And they did. And we went over and won the championship first off. That was a great satisfaction for me and probably my uh, pinnacle in the racing. Bruce McLaren, number nine, has moved into second place and the race is dominated by the Cooper Works team. And Jack Rabham, number eight, has only to complete the course to win the World Championship. The BT-19 was using a 1.5 litre, 92 cubic inch Coventry Climax power unit until Ron Toronach with Australian engine company Repco developed a new V8 engine for Brabham in 1966. It was a total game changer. There were no seat belts. They, they weren't uh, in vogue in 1966. And around it, on each side, uh, there are actually belly tanks uh, which carry something like 80 litres of, of um, racing fuel. So this car is really like a, a mobile fuel tank and not one that you'd like to have an accident in. Yeah, there was a lot of work to it and uh, we worked many hours. The satisfaction was, of course, we drove it the next day and uh, yeah, a win that was worth the, worth the effort. I notice on the BT19, it's it, it's very much a, a, a true lightweight vehicle, you know, paired to the bone. All the aluminium work and the fiberglass work, was that done by your own team or was that done outside by a specialist firm attached to Cooper? Well, a lot of the body work was done outside. Yep. But all the framework and everything and the actual car itself was done in-house. Yep. What advice would you give to a young engineer that was looking to make a name for himself in, 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 the, in the automotive world today? Well, the first thing to do is get trained, really. And there's a lot of good uh, training facilities today where you can go and learn these trades. And uh, that's fantastic, the opportunity that people have got, really. And they've just got to take it up and do it. <laughs>